you, only, only for a half hour, half hour. So um, thank you so much for um, for having me. I, I, I really, um, I'm sorry I missed la la the inaugural year last year, but I'm glad to be here this year. This two is, years ago, oh, two years ago. OK. <laughs> OK, good, good. Um, um, this is, I've really enjoyed this, and um, the conversations have been really fantastic. So I want to talk about, um, um, uh, about hybrid downscaling, which is a, a term that, that um, I think has come into broader currency recently, um, and um, also to make some general comments about um, how we do downscaling and how we make downscaling more credible. The laboratory is um, Sierra Nevada in California, um, but a lot of the issues that I'm going to be talking about are pretty applicable to pretty much anywhere. Um, and if I have time at the end of the talk, I'm going to switch gears totally and um, bring up some issues uh, that came up for me um, based on the talks yesterday. Um, so in the spirit of, of stirring the pot a little bit, I'm going to switch gears at the end if I have time. All right, so, um, so just a quick overview of, of hybrid downscaling. So the essence of it is to do limited dynamical downscaling for a region and then develop simple models, emulators or statistical models that mimic the dynamical model behavior um, that's why we call it hybrid downscaling, because it's a hybrid of dynamical and statistical techniques. And the statistical models can be used to produce um, regional data that correspond to any GCM, um, any time slice, and any forcing scenario. So it, it, it allows for uncertainty quantification um, in a way that just isn't possible with a single dynamical run. Um, and also, I think this is a big advantage. Hybrid downscaling also forces you um, to diagnose the climate change patterns that are produced by dynamical downscaling, because to build the emulator, you have to, the simple model, you have to actually understand um, what is controlling the regional patterns. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. It, this technique also avoids the stationarity assumption that's common to conventional um, <laughs> statistical downscaling techniques, where um, these techniques are, are trained on some historical data set and they're used to make future projections, but, um, but they're, they're, they're um, making projections based on historical relationships that may not hold for the future. Um, and I mentioned uncertainty quanti quantification already. Um, so um, how did we produce this data? Well, here's the region that we're interested in. Here's, um, we have a nine kilometer um, domain over part of the Pacific and um, much of Cal all of California, and then a three kilometer resolution domain over the Sierra Nevada, um, which is the main region of interest here. Um, and then we do a baseline simulation, 1981 to 2015, with um, WARF driven by NAR. And then five future WARF simulations um, from um, models that represent approximately the range of temperature and precipitation outcomes in the fuller CMIP-5 ensemble. And um, these are PGW experiments. So um, we're just imposing the mean change um, and looking at how that's regionalized. And then um, we make um, hybrids, we build emulators to, um, to make predictions of, of temperature, snow cover, uh, snow water equivalent runoff, and soil moisture. Um, and then we can make projections for um, time slices and, and, and um, forcing scenarios and models um, uh, that we're interested in. And in this case, we're looking at mid-century and end-of-century time slices. Um, and um, a couple different forcing scenarios. I'm really going, only going to be talking about RCP 8.5, though, in, in this particular talk. And um, I'll only be talking about temperature and runoff, um, and again, end of century, um, RCP 8.5 here. Um, so this is just the, 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 in very broad strokes, the, the data production. Um, and these are um, dynamically downscaled warming patterns then for um, the Sierra domain. So here is the California border, here's the coast, here's San Francisco, and here's this Sierra Nevada domain. And this is the warming patterns for um, five months that are very important for the annual cycle of water um, in this region. Um, so spanning the wet season, basically. And, um, and um, this is averaged over all the five dynamically downscale models. Um, and we have different warming patterns for each of the models, but the magnitudes um, are, are, are different, but the patterns are actually quite, quite similar. Um, so one thing that you can see um, in these is that warming is often a bit greater on the continental side of this very high mountain barrier. Um, and the other thing that you can see is the imprint of snow albedo feedback. So especially if you look at a month like March, you see um, at the rings of the 
uh, of this mountain chain, you can see the elevated warming um, associated with snow albedo feedback um, in the WARF simulation. Um, and this snow albedo feedback signal is very evident if you look at the corresponding change in snow covered fraction. Um, so again, if you look at March, you see this big retreat of snow and then the enhanced warming um, in, in these middle elevation areas in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so based on these results, we construct a very simple mathematical model that takes as inputs the main drivers of regional warming. Um, and we have determined through some diagnostics, which I can talk about if, if, if you're interested in this, um, we've determined the main drivers are the overall GCM warming in the region. So how much warming does the GCM um, give you in this particular region? Um, what is the contrast in warming between um, North America and the adjacent Pacific Ocean? GCMs um, typically give more warming over continents than over the ocean. Um, it turns out that that effect is important. Um, the Sierra Nevada serves as a big barrier between these continental air masses and these more marine influenced air masses. And so um, that contrast in warming uh, at the larger scale is important. And then finally, um, snow albedo feedback. Um, so with these inputs, then we, we build an emulator or a simple statistical model that produces the warming patterns that mimic those of WARF. Um, and um, we can test this out. This is um, the warming now as a function of elevation for March um, and for June. And you can see that there's this bulge in warming um, at these middle elevation areas. In March, for example, this corresponds to these areas where snow albedo feedback is very active. And in the later months, in June, the warming bulge migrates up the, um, the mountains. And you can see that there's bigger warming um, at, at around uh, 3,500 to 4,000 feet. Um, and both the dynamical results are shown here and the corresponding results from the emulator that um, was built to mimic the dynamical model results. Um, and you can see they overlap almost perfectly. Um, so this means that we can, we can model WARF's warming patterns if we know these three factors. How much warming the GCM gives, how, what's the land sea contrast in warming, and how much snow albedo feedback does WARF produce. Okay, um, so how do these projections stack up against other downscaled data products? So one thing we wanted to understand is um, how do these compare with other ways of producing downscaled data for this region? So here again are, is the warming produced by this hybrid approach as a function of elevation. And um, these are two commonly used downscaling techniques. Here's, um, this is, these are purely statistical techniques. This is called BCSD. Um, and you can see that um, it produces a very flat warming pattern with no imprint of snow albedo feedback. Um, and here's another one. This is BCCA. Um, this is um, also gives you a, a, a very flat warming pattern. Um, and um, if you look at, at the larger scale, um, these warming patterns in, this, in these statistical techniques um, don't differ significantly from those of the GCM. Um, so they're, they're very flat and don't, don't have these, the spatial structure that you see in the WARF simulation. Um, so how does this um, impact something that's important for water resources? Um, so here is the change in runoff timing. Um, so if, if you have a, a big warming, you have a big advance in, in the runoff um, from, from, this, from this mountain complex. Um, that's hugely important for California water resources. For those of you who are not familiar with, um, with California and, and how water works there. Um, but basically, the reservoirs that line the Sierra Nevada are sized according to how big the snowpack is. And if the, if the snowpack disappears and the water runs off earlier, that poses a huge challenge for water storage. Um, so here is um, the runoff timing change with these two purely statistical techniques. Um, and you can see the runoff timing advances on the order of about 40 days, coming 40 days earlier. Um, and here's the runoff timing change with the hybrid downscaling. And you can see that, um, that the warming um, is, is greater, especially in these middle elevation areas, because of snow albedo feedback. And that leads to um, a bigger advance in runoff timing. So it really does matter for questions that um, are important for water resources, um, which downscaling methods you use. and and whether they include physical processes that um, we believe are very important for climate change. Um, so one question that we've been looking at recently is, is trying to figure out why these downscaling methods differ. Why do they give different answers? And, and, um, and so um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, addressing this question. 
Uh, so here is the warming from a single GCM. This happens to be the uh, CNRM CM5 um, over this region of interest. Um, and here's the warming again from that GCM that's interpolated now to the native grid of the North American Regional Reanalysis. Um, so one thing that you can see here is um, that there is, I can just tell you, these, this enhanced warming um, in, the, in the global model corresponds to where the, the global model puts the snow margin. Okay, so, um, and so when NAR interpolates that, it, you know, it, it, it creates this warming um, in, in a region that is, um, you know, where, where, where we actually don't have a snow margin in reality. Um, um, so this means that um, the warming has features that we know are, are quite unphysical um, in the global model. And this is a phenomenon that's been, been written about quite a bit by, by many other people. Um, um, so here now is the high resolution warming that's, that's predicted by another uh, purely statistical technique called LOCA, um, which is, um, um, which was built to, um, to downscale extremes, especially hydrologic extremes, and it is really the state of the art in the U.S. for, um, for, for, for uh, statistical downscaling. And um, an example of, of that is that um, it's, it's one of the official techniques for the U.S. National Climate Assessment um, and is, is very often used um, by practitioners, people who are using climate change data, um, to, to try to make um, projections for systems of interest. Um, and so if you look at what um, LOCA produces, so this is, I'm gonna explain this, the meaning of this. This is, um, LOCA is, in this case, it's tr the training period is the historical period, of course, um, and NAR is the um, large scale um, um, training data set, and LIVNA, which is very much like PRISM, um, is the high resolution data set, and LOCA is built um, to mimic the relationships between the NAR data and the LIVNA data. And then it's fed data from the GCM to produce these warming patterns for the future. Um, and you can see that the LOCA produces a warming pattern that's almost identical to the GCM interpolated warming pattern. Okay, so it really doesn't add too much value. Um, and, um, and here is now the warming patterns produced by WARF when driven by this um, same global model using the PGW method. Um, and so really, I think it's pretty fascinating. Um, first of all, um, the domain, the, this is the kind of the art of regional modeling, the domain is large enough that um, WARF actually fixes um, the erroneous warming um, in, in the global model. Um, so we don't have this um, elevated warming where, where the global model thinks that there's um, snow albedo feedback. And on top of that, WARF puts the snow albedo feedback um, in the right place where the snow margin is actually located. Um, and these warming patterns are actually very different, of course. Um, um, so pretty interesting um, that dynamical downscaling is able, able to, to, um, to fix um, these obvious issues in the GCM. Um, so why do these downscaling methods differ? One hypothesis might be um, that the um, the statistical method is trained on a, on a, on a, histor on a historical data set other than, than, than WARF. So um, you might imagine if we trained LOCA instead of on LIVNA, we trained it on, on WARF data, maybe it would produce this pattern. So maybe there's something about WARF, the, the WARF dynamical downscaling data that might be, um, might be the reason, or maybe there's something inherent in the, the statistical method that causes it to produce this GCM interpolated pattern. Um, so we can train LOCA on WARF historical data instead of on LIVNA. Um, and so that's what we did. We, we, we built um, a new LOCA model that's LOCA NAR WARF. And it's using the same baseline simulation that we used um, as the baseline for our climate change experiments. And here is that pattern. Um, and you can see that um, this pattern matches exactly the, the GCM interpolated pattern and the warming pattern is produced when you train LOCA on LIVNA. Um, so, um, um, the, and so one, one question now is what, what is the reason for that? Um, and the reason for that is that this warming pattern um, is a feature of the future climate that simply has no analog in the historical period, um, no matter which data set is actually used. Um, and, so, and so if we think about how the, the, the statistical methods work, um, they search for a warm day or a, or, a, or a series of warm days in the historical record. 
Um, and then they composite them to create future warm days. Um, and so that's very different from future warming, which is sustained over many, many years. Um, and the future warming has a snowpack loss that's very different from the snowpack anomaly that's associated with a single warm day in the historical period. And so the, um, the, the purely statistical methods just simply don't have um, the analogous um, snowpack loss um, in, in the training data set that we know is a feature of the future climate. Um, and, so, um, and so this is, um, again, getting at the stationarity assumption in the, the statistical techniques that um, really is, is, is an issue for producing these, these warming patterns. Um, so just some quick conclusions on um, this part of the talk. So um, to have confidence in high resolution climate projections that are, are actually used for decision making, um, it's, it's important to evaluate the physical mechanisms that underpin the regional change patterns. And I really like hybrid downscaling because it, it formalizes the evaluation process. Um, it, it, it forces you to understand why the, the, the regional model is producing the patterns that it does. And a, as a benefit, you get an emulator that can downscale an arbitrarily large GCM ensemble um, for any time slice in any forcing scenario. And um, we've seen that sterile beetle feedback acts as critical um, spatial structure to warming patterns um, um, with important follow on effects, um, say, on runoff timing. And these purely uh, statistical methods have trouble capturing the warming pattern that's associated with snow beetle feedback um, because that process has no analog um, at the daily time scales of the historical record that are used for training um, for these purely statistical methods. Okay, so um, do I have time to dive into something different? Okay, um, this is, I realize I'm doing something pretty unconventional. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about extreme precipitation. It was inspired a bit by the talks yesterday. Um, so I actually, last night, shortened the talk that I just gave um, so I could make some time for this. Um, but there's, we've been looking also at global models and, and how, um, how they uh, produce changes in extreme precipitation. And um, the results, actually, I think are quite relevant for this group. So I thought I would um, just share them. Um, quickly, and I talked about this at the GUX meeting um, a few months ago, so this is um, a repeat for, for some people. Um, um, but we've been looking at the CMIP 5 GCMs, and we've been looking at um, how they um, produce trade offs between increases in extreme precipitation and um, decreases or smaller increases in non extreme precipitation. And these were effects that were talked about yesterday in some of the, some of the talks already. Um, um, and so um, for every GCM, you can calculate the change in the daily extreme precipitation, um, and you can define this at the 99th percentile. Um, and you can average that over the whole globe. This is a very globally aggregated statistic. Um, we can also calculate the change in daily precipitation during these non-extreme precipitation events. This is the rest of the distribution. Um, and here is the result when we scatter these two quantities against one another. Um, this is really fascinating. The, um, so here's the change in the really extreme precipitation, the 99th percentile. Um, and this is the change in the rest of the distribution, the non-extreme. And um, these models, if you plot them this way, they, they, they fall um, on this. They have this inverse relationship to one another. So if a particular model has a big increase in extreme precipitation, it has um, actually a decrease in the non-extreme precipitation. And vice versa, if it has a small increase in the really extreme events, it has a, um, a, a relatively, um, has an in increase in the non-extreme events. So these are inversely related to one another. Um, and so what are the dynamics that control this variation? Um, that's something that we got very interested in. Um, so um, so the, the models seem to be saying that changes in one part of the distribution have to be compensated for by changes in the other part of the distribution. Um, and this is highly robust to how we define extremely wet and not so extremely wet parts of the distribution. So here are the corresponding correlations for different ways of defining extreme precipitation. So it just doesn't matter. Um, basically, um, no matter how you define it, there's an anti-correlation between the extreme wetting and, and, and rest of the distribution. Um, and so this, is, this compensation effect is a big driver behind these very large 
um, behind the very large spread in GCMs in the, in the changes in extreme precipitation. Um, so we all um, are aware of the basic hydrologic cycle intensification that happens in models. Um, the atmospheric energy budget changes so as to favor more precipitation um, on, on average. Um, and that's, that's, that's a well-known feature of, of GCM simulations. The atmospheric energy budget changes differently in different models. Um, and so that produces a spread in how much um, the precipitation increases globally on average. Um, and if we think about the sum of the extreme and non-extreme precipitation, that has to equal the global precipitation increase. Um, so the more the global hydrologic cycle intensifies in a particular model, the more um, it should be shifted to the upper right of this plot. And the less global hydrologic cycle intensification that we see in a particular model, um, the more it should be shifted towards the lower left. So we should expect these models to be striated um, in, in this way, um, depending on how much global hydrologic cycle intensification we see in a particular model. So now let's color code these, these, these numbers here by the global precipitation increase. Um, so here's our color bar for that. So red colors are more increased, blue are less. Um, and if we now color code them, we see that they are in fact striated in this way. So the models with the bigger global increase in, in hydrologic cycle intensification um, have are, are, are residing um, more in this part of the plot, and the ones that have less are in this part. So part of the story here is how much global precipitation increase does a model produce? That's dictated by the global energy budget. Um, so this is par part, of, part of the reason why we have spread in these local precipitation extremes. Um, but this main axis of spread um, is associated with a trade-off between changes in extreme and non-extreme non precipitation. And f even for models that have the same global mean precipitation increase, um, there are big differences in how much, how much extreme precipitation increase you get. Um, so these models here, if we go back, well, these models are kind of organized along the line. These models have the same global mean precipitation increase, but very, very different changes in extremes. Um, so what's causing that variation? One important connection to the trade-off is, is with resolution. And so here now the models are color-coded by their resolution. Um, and this is the approximate um, resolution length scale. So this is um, given in, in, in degrees. If, if imagine that all the grid cells are, are squares. Um, and so the models that have higher resolution um, are, are blue and coarser resolution are red. Um, and you can see that there's not a perfect relationship, but there's quite a, quite, a, quite a relationship, actually, between the resolution of the model and how it partitions between the very extreme and non-extreme precipitation. Um, so these higher resolution models are the ones that give the biggest increase in extremes um, and, the, and, and the biggest decrease in the non-extreme, so the biggest um, increase in contrast. Um, and these very coarse models um, have, have very weak changes in the in the big extreme events and, 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 and a little bit of an increase in the non-extreme cases. Um, so um, the highest resolution GCM, of course, is, is so far from being convection permitting um, that it'd be really silly to try to extrapolate from this relationship um, to the convective scale. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think that there's a, 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 a hint here that um, resolution really matters for um, for how much of, it, of an increase in extreme precipitation um, you get. So the GCMs seem to admit that the character of extremes really does change at, at higher resolution. And um, there are some interesting hints. I, at the GUX meeting, I, um, I got started talking to the, the um, GPCP people, the people who produce these precipitation data sources, and they've been showing that the increases in extremes and observations are quite a bit greater than what's seen in the global models. And this has been um, talked about um, also in, in other contexts. Um, and so I, I think that um, this community 
really um, really does have quite a lot to say about um, about changes in extremes, and I think it's really only through these types of efforts that we can can truly discover um, what what um, what the implications are um, of climate change for changes in extremes. So um, I, this is um, I think relevant to the discussion yesterday. So even though it's not snow and cold stuff, um, I wanted to to also bring it up. So anyway, I'm glad I was able to fit that in. <laughs>